you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. Occasionally, the world of the Fortian throws up a unique case that doesn't seem to fit into any of the usual categories. From the Dover Demon to the Enfield Horror and the more recent Fresno Nightcrawler, cryptozoology can give us some very strange creatures. One of the weirdest occurred in the little town of Van Meter, Iowa, in the autumn of 1903. The origin behind this creature has baffled many a researcher, but today I'm delighted to welcome back Chad Lewis to discuss the Van Meter monster and his in-depth investigation alongside Kevin Lee Nelson and Noah Voss. If you've never heard of the Van Meter monster, then prepare to be baffled and mystified by a most singular creature that terrorised the town folk over a week before once again disappearing into Fortean folklore. We also dive into Chad's latest book, Supernatural Dares of the Midwest, which sees Chad bravely investigate over 40 supernatural dares said to punish those foolhardy enough to try them. As always, a big thank you to Chad for joining me to dive into the Van Meter mystery. As always, you can support the show via our Patreon link in this week's show notes for early releases and bonus content. We're also on all social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel by searching for Mysteries and Monsters. Our website is available, and you can find that at mysteriesandmonsters.com. Our work for the show, as always, by Dean Bestall. The show is produced, once again, by Brennan Store of the Ghost Story Guys. And Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. So, Van Meter, Iowa, in 1903, was about to be the site of a very unwelcome visitor. September 1903, and the sleepy town of Van Meter in Iowa was about to be rudely awakened from its slumber. Over the course of several nights, the townsfolk lived in fear as some kind of giant bat-like creature arrived to cause panic. To discuss this wonderful cryptozoological conundrum and much more besides, it's another warm welcome back to Mr. Chad Lewis. Chad, welcome! Greetings from the Northwoods of Wisconsin! Ah, lovely to have you back again, my friend. How are we? Doing great. It's great to be back talking weirdness, monsters, and who knows what. Absolutely, absolutely, and I'm sure the listeners will be delighted to hear you're back as well because your shows are always extremely popular, um, but this time I've got you all on your own, Chad, so um, how's things going and what you been up to recently? Well, things are great here. It's nice to be solo on your program. I don't have to carry the weight of uh, Kevin Nelson dragging us down with his uh, research, so that's always fun. <laughs> Okay. No, I'm surviving here. <laughs> Not Kevin, he won't listen to this anyway. Um, no, it's great. Things are wonderful here in the U.S. How are things over there? Yeah, slowly but surely improving. Um, uh, our vaccinations are rolling out. Things are on track to reopen in a couple of weeks and, and keeping moving forwards. And lots of people have already had their second shot. So... Um, a sense of normality seems to be on the horizon, Chad. Oh, perfect time for everyone to get back out and search for monsters. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I'm going to be clocking up some miles once everything's lifted, I can assure you of that. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. As soon as things calm down, I'm, I'm just itching just to hit the back roads, even if it's just looking at some cornfields. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm... <laughs> Just all this pent-up energy ready to go. Absolutely, absolutely. I tell you what, Bigfoot doesn't stand much of a chance, I think, when we all get lo- <laughs> we all get free from lockdown. Somebody's going to find him within about a week. 
Yeah, that'll be the best part of this uh, lockdown, <laughs> won't it? Yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. So, Chad, the Van Meter Monster, um, yourself, Kevin and Noah, gave us a wonderful book a couple of years ago in regards to this fascinating case. Um, and once again, it's it's one of those that I think when you hear about it, you're not really sure just how strange it is until you begin to look at it. So what brought it to your attention and, and what was it that excited you most about this very unusual case? Well, Kevin, Noah and I were traveling to Iowa. We had a legend trip planned and uh, we had some places mapped out we wanted to visit that we had never investigated before, a werewolf sighting in a cave, this haunted bridge, and a few other things. But we always like to have this anchor case, just something that's really, really cool and odd. And I had done in the past a series of books on old newspaper articles of UFOs and weird creatures and ghosts and bizarre deaths and the like. And I remember I had done... Uh, three-fourths of an Iowa one, mm. and I had just put it on pause as other projects took over, as they often do, and so I had this stack of about 200 newspaper articles from, you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s in Iowa, yeah. so I started flipping through thinking, maybe there's something I missed, maybe there will be a really old, cool case that we could visit, mm. and then I stumbled onto this a Des Moines newspaper talking about this giant bat-like creature, this monster of awful form, terrorizing the small town of Van Meter and immediately dropped everything else. And we said, that's where we're going. Let's check this out. And that's how it began. <laughs> I mean, what I've always loved about this case is, is it's extremely unique, Chad, because we simply have a real weird run of incidents that seem to occur late September, early October in, in 1903. And what's always surprised me about this is it's not one of those where we've had some kind of cyclical event or even something very similar to this. This is one of the most unique cryptozoological puzzles I think I've ever read about. I'm with you there. When I first read the articles... I thought when we went there, it was going to be very quick stop in Van Meter because obviously this story had to be a hoax. It's just too bizarre. There are too many weird components that I'd never heard of for it to be real. It didn't fit into any one category. Um, so when we got there, I thought, well, what else are we going to do when this is done? Because it was going to be so quick. And from the moment we stepped into the public library looking for some old newspaper articles and we met the librarian, Jolena Welker, at that time she was the librarian, we quickly realized that there was a lot more to this case than we ever imagined. And to this day, it remains one of the weirdest cases I've ever heard of. Uh, especially that I've ever investigated. Yeah, and um, what I love about this case is it's one of those that would make a fantastic film because it's such a it's a slow burn because it starts really gradually and it ends in a in a massive flap literally <laughs> towards the end. But I love this fact that it just starts really nondescript. I believe the first real notable incident is one of the local townspeople, a gentleman called U.G. Griffith, um, sees a mysterious light bobbing about. And one of the other aspects of this case that I think sets it apart, Chad, is that most of the principal witnesses were really respectable members of the community. They were all people that were looked up upon and had important parts to play in the town's business. And remember that this was 1903, small town, 20 minutes southwest of Des Moines, Iowa, town of about 900 people, very rural. So when Eugene Griffiths was coming home late at night and he saw a weird light over one of the buildings, he immediately thought, intruder, bank robber, or someone trying to steal from a store. Mm. So he just slowed down to take a better look at it. Obviously, he wasn't thinking some giant eight-foot bat-like creature. And as he paused for a moment, the light just simply vanished, 
and then reappeared on the other side of the street on top of that building in a matter of just a couple seconds. Uh, some years later, people would say that it seemed to have flown to the other side, but he didn't give it much thought after that. Just a weird light disappeared. You know, things back then, back into what can I do next day to survive? You know, I've got to earn a living. I've got to beat back the harsh environment that I'm in. So he didn't give it much thought after that. And you're right. It started out as just your traditional, you know, UFO encounter. Yeah. I think that's as calm as it stays, really, though, Chad, because it's it seems to be one of those, because obviously... Uh, Ulysses, I mean, what a wonderful name as well, some of the characters in this story. Um, and his brother ran the, was it the local hardware shop that they ran, the Griffiths Brothers? Yeah, they were implement dealers, so they were dealing with farm machinery and probably did repairs, uh, you know, edging a living out as best they could with that. And they, they were, as you had mentioned, well-respected in the community, that they were business owners, that they had a great reputation, and that many of the witnesses throughout the entire event were very similar. And not only were they the most prominent people in town, but they were actually real people. As I mentioned, having done so many books on old newspaper accounts, oftentimes newspapers, believe it or not, would use fake names. And you could never track a witness down in the town. They would just copy it from a different story or just make it up or embellish it. But not only did these people actually exist, they ended up being some of the most respected people in town. And when we started researching it, of course, none of them were alive. But we talked to several old timers in Van Meter who remembered the witnesses that when these old timers were kids, they remembered that. The witnesses were the men who ran the town. If they say something happened, it happened, is what the old-timers told us. Yeah, I mean, was that the most surprising aspect of this? Because obviously there are newspaper reports. But as you often refer to there, Chad, when we look back at some of these older cases, a lot of them tend to be, um, especially the ones in newspapers, seem to have been regurgitated from papers all across the states. Because in those days, essentially... A hundred miles away was it near enough a continent for some people. They had no idea what was happening a hundred miles up the state. That's exactly right. And that happened quite a bit. But what I noticed with this article and uh, subsequent articles that followed is that unlike what a lot of people think that it was done for publicity or tourism or to make money off of it, the articles coming out of Van Meter actually discouraged people from coming saying there's nothing to see here, don't worry, don't come here, you know, this is all a fishy story, don't buy it, you know, sure, some things weird have happened, but nothing that, like, your imagination believes. So unless they were using reverse psychology and very smart about their tourism, they weren't looking to profit off of this case. Yeah, yeah, because often a lot of these cases that we see in these stories are, are so far-fetched and wonderful, and when people turn up in these far-flung locations, there's usually some kind of shop or stall or, or something trying to, to profit off it, and this doesn't seem to have happened at all with this one, does it? It doesn't, and not only that, but it seemed like a lot of the people in town were absolutely terrified that instead of wanting people to come to their town and experience it, which... There wasn't much there to experience. They were concerned for their safety, that they half the town thought in the beginning that it was a robber or a bank robber or an intruder, where the other half were kind of split that they thought it was something unknown. And I think that that difference in the community played out through the week. So the next incident is when this story takes a life of its own and becomes a bit more because obviously people Griffiths had, had clearly spoken to a few people Chad in the town and said you'll you know I've seen some strange lights bobbing about overnight and people are thinking well you know we know we know this chap he's he seems pretty down to earth and he's a very respected member of the community he's not going to try and pull his leg um, but then the next incident that occurs which is the following day 
um, involved the town doctor, a Dr. Olcott, I think it is? It did, it, uh, Dr. Olcott. And I, I, in my mind, I imagine the next day as U.G. Griffith was, you know, making his rounds around town, a small two-block downtown area, you know, he was talking about it and maybe even alerting people, like, keep an eye out. There was some weird lights in the sky. Uh, maybe somebody's casing out the place. You know, just keep an eye out for it. Uh, but it wasn't until the next night, in the middle of the night, around the same time that Griffith saw this ball of light, Dr. Alcott was sleeping above his office. He was the town's uh, local doctor, and he awoke in the middle of the night with a bright light flashing in his room, which in 1903 would have been a rare event. So he stumbles over to the window in the middle of the night and lets his eyes adjust a bit and looks down, and there on the main drag of Van Meter, he sees this giant eight-foot bat-like creature with huge leather-like wings, no fur, no feathers that we know of. And I have to give Dr. Alcock credit. He didn't just watch this thing. He grabbed his weapon and ran outside and shot at it five times. The newspaper said he kept the last bullet in case he needed it, and he barricaded himself back in his office, waiting for the safety of sunlight to come the next morning. And he was certain he had hit it. He was certain he had killed whatever this thing was, but he went back into his office, and the next morning, there was no proof whatsoever. Yeah, there's a brilliant sentence in your book that says, Known as a plucky little fellow, he and his heart raced from bread as his skilled hands wrapped around his nearby gun of immense proportions. <laughs> yeah, and th those are the kind of details. Like later in the, the week, they'll, they'll talk about people taking deliberate aim, uh, that they weren't just scared. And remember 1903, people were accustomed uh, to shooting and weapons. Many of these men were farmers or ranchers, so they had weapons with them. They knew how to use it. So when you're talking about somebody in the middle of the night shooting five times at an eight-foot creature and it having no effect, I mean, that seems a little odd that you would think it would have some effect or maybe simply missed all five shots. I don't know. Mm. Um, well, that's the other aspect. Like you say, you know, we're talking about an era in American history where, you know, as, as we've referred to, uh, Griffiths would have probably thought that somebody was was casing the town maybe trying to size up what the bank was like or whatever because you know we're still in the era of of butch cassidy and the sundance kid and bank robberies and train robberies chad you know this is a it's a century ago but for for many it's it's a completely different world it was really closer to the frank and jesse james outlaw on horseback days than it was to the prohibition john dillinger gangster era Mm. So you're right, any weird light would have been, is somebody targeting our small town? Remember back then, small towns were on their own. You yeah. weren't going to call the National Guard in or your police uh, force. They weren't coming. You were kind of on your own to protect your own place. So that certainly was going through their mind, I think, in the very beginning. And after Dr. Alcott's experience, this is where, in my mind, the idea of it being a hoaxer, is done because yeah. if you're out hoaxing it and now people are starting to shoot at you that's probably when you tuck it in and forget about it <laughs> yes very true very true and one of the strange aspects about Alcott's incident is he sort of describes it looking as though this light that awoke him Chad was coming from some kind of horn on whatever this creature was he was convinced that this thing had the ability to project its own light and very bright. And again, this was at a time when you weren't just grabbing your flashlight or your high powered uh, flashlight and throwing it around everywhere. It would have been very rare for the top of a building for a light to come flashing into your room. And I think that's what caught his attention. And I think that's what spooked him, thinking, what the heck? And maybe it even rattled in his head about the previous night's incident with uh, UG Griffith. As we, we're sort of throwing it about there, Chad, the next incident is perhaps one that 
would maybe lead certain people who don't really know enough about the case to suspect that this is what the plan was all along because the next incident involves a gentleman called Clarence, Clarence Dunn who was who was known as Peter in the town um, who actually worked at the bank he was a cashier I believe wasn't he yeah, he actually became the uh, br uh, manager of the bank yeah and yeah and I imagine by the third day having heard the previous two accounts that the town was probably pretty split where people thought yeah it's a bank robber or others thinking maybe there's something more sinister to this and Clarence Dunn was certainly in the camp of the former of it being a a hoax or somebody robbing the bank so on the third night he actually left his family unprotected out at their farmhouse about a mile from downtown and he went into the bank with his shotgun filled with buckshot to protect the town's money that he thought he was doing his duty that if no one else is going to protect this town it has to be me they're not going to rob my bank hmm. well as you as you referred to earlier Chad these towns are on their own um, a lot of them everybody's money is in the local bank people's entire life savings everything they've worked for everything they've made in their businesses and their farms everything is stored in the local bank and that's what he was protecting so he was in there and it was late at night again 1 a.m. 2 a.m. Mm. is when all these sightings seem to occur mm. and he sees a bright light a flashing into the bank window and he's there heavily armed and behind it he can kind of see the silhouette of something large and he sees the beak of a bird and the outline of a giant creature you know certainly not any bank robber that he's ever seen before mm. so he's so terrified he blasts out the front window of the bank from the inside with his shotgun and he too is too afraid to go out in the middle of the night so he just barricades himself in until the safety of the next morning when he goes outside he's expecting to find a dead bank robber or a carcass or blood fur feathers something that would indicate that his shotgun blast hit the monster or whatever it was but there was nothing there but when he started to move around the building looking for any evidence he saw what appeared to be these giant three-toed tracks in the mud on the side of the building and that's once again another one of these strange aspects because the thing as I as I touched on right at the beginning when we started talking just before Griffiths sees the light Chad is that in every single incident as the week progresses it seems like this creature or whatever this was is doing something else because I think doesn't it start making some weird noises as well when it encounters Clarence which is once again we've got something that starts off as, as a light then it's a creature shining a light then it's a creature vocalizing shining a light and now it's leaving footprints as well you're absolutely right it was making this raspy like coughing type um, some equate it to files being rubbed together this raspy noise that uh, Dunn could hear as well and the newspaper said that he made a cast of at least one of these prints of this creature but what became of it we don't know that if the cast was ever taken nobody's ever found it and when I inquired along with my colleagues uh, inquired with the State Historical Society in Des Moines wondering if they had had anything on their collection that would be similar to that they were very skeptical that a cast of any sort from 1903 would have survived to this day without being very well maintained that if it was just in someone's attic or their basement that it probably used uh, materials that would not have held up so well over the years so I had hopes that the cast would someday be found but maybe it doesn't exist anymore even if it ever did yeah another another tantalizing morsel of potential Chad but you're right there seems to be an escalation that from just a mere sighting to maybe 
putting his uh, uh, toes in the water, testing the water with Dr. Alcott, seeing how close it could get to actually leaving behind some sort of physical evidence. And the cases only got weirder as the week went on. Yeah. Because it seems that the, the next um, esteemed member of the local community who has a as an encounter is a gentleman called O.V. White, who I believe owned the the local furniture store and he as many people in those days chad actually lived above his business didn't he it was very common he owned the hardware and furniture business and it was very common much like dr alcott sleeping above his business that you know even if you had a family you would have your residence there in the same building um and yeah he was uh there sleeping and again, those weird noises awoke him in the middle of the night, and he went over to the window, and he spotted this creature on a post outside, and it appeared to be sleeping. By his account, that he let his eyes get adjusted to the dark, and it seemed not to be moving at all. So he took his weapon, and again, with deliberate aim, according to the newspaper, blasted it. And when he hit it, he said it woke up and it flashed its light on him and it released some weird odor into the air. And by the time this stench hit Ovi White, he said it erased the rest of his memory for the evening. That That's all he could remember. The last thing was being hit with this mysterious odor. But luckily, his gunshot woke up a gentleman across the street named Sidney Gregg who walked over to the window to see what all the commotion was about. And as he did, he saw the visitor climbing down the pole using its beak as a brace, um, making its way down like a parrot might do. And then when it got to the main street, it just took off running and flew off out in the direction of the old abandoned mine. And what's great is Sidney Gregg told the newspaper that it didn't even occur to him to grab his weapon and to start shooting it. And that's something I found very consistent with witnesses to this very day, that when they see something odd, it doesn't even occur to them to grab their phone or their recorder or their weapon. Their mind is trying to process, what the heck am I experiencing? So it doesn't even dawn on them that maybe I should grab something to document this. And Sidney Gregg was the same way. His weapon was nearby, he said, but he didn't even bother to grab it. Yeah, I think that is often a, one of those things, Chad, that, that people will often say to witnesses of extraordinary events. Well, why don't you take a picture or, or why don't you capture it, video it, whatever. But as someone that's seen strange things, I remember once walking to work, Chad, and I saw a gentleman run over on a bicycle by a by a motorcycle and it was it was like it, 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 it i was watching it in a dream chad i mean luckily everybody was okay they were bruised and shaken up but it it just happened and i, and I couldn't do anything for for what felt like ages it was probably three or four seconds um before i suddenly ran to to see if i could assist but even something as normal as as that kind of incident just leaves you stunned by what you've just witnessed I think it's so out of normal everyday bounds, especially when we're talking about this giant cryptid, mm. that it would be, I'd be more amazed that somebody was able to grab something and do something than I would of them being almost frozen, not so much in terror, but maybe wonder and disbelief and just that not knowing what it was and their mind scrambling through every possible explanation. So it doesn't surprise me at all that many of these people, you know, didn't react at super speeds. And remember, for a lot of these sightings, not just of the visitor, but the supernatural in general, a lot of them are fleeting. They're not where somebody watches this creature for 30 minutes. It's that it passes in front of the road in front of them very quickly or they catch it out of the corner of their eye and it's gone. So many times people don't even have a chance to figure out what's going on, much less try to document it. It seems, as, as we've said there, every day, 
this strange thing turns up often at, at around 1am 1, 1 in the morning Chad um, sort of bothering <laughs> bothering certain people in the town and when we get to Friday night early Saturday morning we're kind of at the apex of this whole situation now and um, and the town had an old coal mine which had been abandoned, but I believe there'd been a, a, a brick and tile factory built in the in the same area. Um, and once again, we've got a, a shift of workers, I think under the, the supervision of a gentleman called J.L. Platt. Um, and once again, one o'clock, some strange noises grab his attention. At this point, the townsfolk seem to know several things about this creature. Mm. One, as far as we know, it seemed to be nocturnal, only appearing at night. Two, it seemed to be afraid of the train whistle, because in the several uh, earlier incidents, when it was in town and it was about to leave, the fast mail came by, which was the train at the time, and it blew its whistle, and the witnesses observed that the creature kind of was spooked by that and flew off out toward the old abandoned coal mine, which sounds like it's off in the distance, but it's really only about three blocks away from Main Street Van Meter. And right next to the old abandoned coal mine was this big brick and tile factory where they had crews working in three different shifts. And that's when they heard uh, this noise coming up from the abandoned coal mine and the newspapers described it as it sounded like Satan and a regiment of his imps were coming up from hell to wage battle on Van Meter. And your theory of it escalating throughout the week, that gets confirmed here because now when this thing comes out of the mine and this posse is gathered around watching, it is not alone. It has a smaller, almost identical version of itself with it. And whether that's the female gender of the species or the offspring, I don't know. But now there's two of these creatures. And as soon as it got, you know, dark and midnight-ish, they flew off into town. And the townsfolk were left thinking, how many are there of these things? Yes. Are we going to expect to see dozens? I mean, up until that point, as far as we know, they were dealing with one of these things. Now they had two of them on their hands. Yeah. And I think one of the interesting aspects of this is, even though this is extremely unusual and people have been scared out of their wits by whatever this was, um, the, the guys at the tile factory seem to think, right, we're going to put this mystery to bed now. So it's almost as if the posse decides that the creature mustn't light light because I think doesn't the call go out for everybody to kind of turn their lights on and everybody goes and gets weapons and gets ready for if this creature returns to the mine shaft they're going to be prepared it was almost as if a modern day tornado siren went off uh, where the town sounded the monster siren and told everyone to keep their place as lit as they could keep an eye out for this thing and have your weapons at hand and again, the townsfolk must have known that it uh, liked to prowl at night. And these mine uh, employees out at the brick and tile factory next to the mine, these were, you know, strong, sturdy, big men that you would think wouldn't get spooked by anything. And here they are, terrified of their town being overrun by this monster or monsters. And they said, we're going to put an end to it. Gather your weapons, meet out here, and when these things come back, they're going to meet our force. So that's exactly what they did. They all gathered around the opening of the mine, and they waited. And yet, this is another perplexing aspect to this case, because all the other incidents seem to be quite short-lived, Chad, and they're all about 1am, and the creature just departs, like you say, startled by the whistle or, or perhaps just annoyed at being shot at. <laughs> perhaps. Yeah. But on this occasion, they seem to go this creature and its smaller partner in crime seem to disappear for quite a while, don't they? They do. They're gone almost all night. Where they went, what they did, we have no idea. But as soon as daybreak was about to form, they come back, and the town's ready for them. 
And the town starts blasting them, of course, with everything they have. The newspaper jokingly, or maybe not so jokingly, said that the shots could have sunk the Spanish fleet. That's how many people shot at it. But they also said that outside of it releasing that strange odor again after being shot, that it had really no effect. It didn't bother them. They descended back into the mine. And whether they were impervious to all the shots or maybe these people were the worst shots in Iowa, I don't know. But (laughs) they just simply descended back into this mine. And that's really where the story is kind of left as a cliffhanger, that the newspaper articles end there, that these things are down in the mine and the townspeople are trying to put their best plan in order to kill these things. And that's it. They don't come back and tell us what happened. And out of all the places I've ever been, I've never seen a town that knew less of their history than Van Meter. Mm. And this isn't a knock on the town at all, but they didn't have a historical society. They didn't know what became of the mine, that the mine was eventually boarded up and covered in, but nobody knows exactly when or how. Even the current owners of the land who owned it back then, um, they had no idea. We talked with uh, an old timer who owned the land and he gave us a tour of it and he brought us to the spot where the mine opening was. And unless you knew that there was a huge mine underneath you, you'd have no idea. But this mine was 250 feet deep, miles of tunnels. They were mining coal and they had teams of donkeys down there. It was a big establishment. Mm. And unless you knew it was there, you wouldn't know that there was, you were standing on top of a mine. And he told us that as a kid, him and his cousins played around the mine, and they always had this odd feeling that something wasn't right. Even though he was this diehard skeptic, you know, salt of the earth farmer type that didn't believe in any of this stuff. He still got an uneasy feeling while being by that mine. But what happened to it? Did they dynamite the mine? Did they let it flood over? We have no idea whatsoever. And I suppose when you guys went down there, Chad, what's what's the town now? Because it strikes me as one of those, as you refer to, it seems a town that doesn't seem to really know what it is anymore. It's It's kind of just there. It doesn't seem to know where it's come from. It certainly doesn't seem to know where it's going to go. Um, so when you went there, what's the, the general consensus in the town now about what happened? Are they nonplussed by it? Do they all think it was just a, a, a hoax or just mass hysteria? What What's the modern interpretation of these events now? It's interesting because the town itself is pretty close to what it was like in 1903. In some ways... It's a little bit smaller even than it was. It's a slowly, probably in another couple decades, going to be a suburb of Des Moines as Des Moines reaches its sprawl closer to Van Meter. But it's still around 900 people, and it's still just a couple main blocks. Mm -hmm. And I think the town is probably as split as they were back in those days, that many of them probably think it's a hoax. Some believe that it was some type of demon or satanic being. Others believed it was this unknown creature that was released from the mining, that the miners inadvertently released this creature from the depths and it came out. So there's a lot of different theories that run the entire spectrum. But what I'm most impressed with is that the town embraces the legend, even Mm -hmm. if they don't believe in it. They think it's a cool, historical uh, some notoriety for their town that sets it apart and they embrace it. And I think that's the fun part that even people who are skeptics still see the fun in the story, even if they don't truly believe in it. I mean, like I say, I would imagine most people outside of Iowa, if it wasn't for this weird creature, Chad, they'd never probably have heard of the town of Van Meter. It really has put them on the map. And if any of your listeners are, you know, ufologists or love UFO stories, they're probably ticking off the boxes of things that we now know in the field 
that were unheard of in 1903 from missing time to possible screen memories to weaponry not working on these things, disappearing lights, all these things that are now trademarks and hallmarks of abduction scenarios. But back then it was unheard of. So if the story was made up, uh, the the author, H.H. H. Phillips, who was the uh, postmaster in town, another prestigious uh, occupation there, you know, he was way ahead of UFO researchers by about 50 or 60 years. Yeah. I mean, obviously, when you guys often go into these cases, Chad, and have a look at it, one of the things that's always strikes me about the, the quality of, of your work is the fact that you will often look at the, the possible explanations. So yourself, Kevin and, and Noah, when you were looking at what the possible easiest fit to this is, because it is a, such a strange case that, that could take, is it cryptozoological? Is it ufology? Is this just a case of mass hysteria? Where did you start to kind of try and analyze what had gone on and where did that lead you? Our first conversations were trying to gather as much evidence as we could find. And that involved looking through the old newspaper accounts, talking to old timers, uh, talking with the historical societies in the nearby communities, trying to piece as much of the puzzle and sort fact from fiction as we could. And at that point, we started saying, okay, if this thing wasn't a hoax, what are the other possibilities? And let's go through them all and not leave any out because let's see what might be the best fit. And as we were going through, we looked at it being some misidentification of known animals, a turkey vulture or other things that might fit the bill. Um, we also looked at it being some creature that's unknown to science or perhaps thought to have been extinct. We looked at mass hysteria, misidentification, and then we even turned to more bizarre theories, if you will, of maybe this thing was extraterrestrial or ultra-terrestrial or some time traveler of some sort or cosmic trickster. And the problem with this case is that because it's so weird and unique and unusual, there's really no one category that covers everything. I was talking with a, a couple of guys who uh, really liked the book the other day, and they thought this thing was a turkey vulture. And they rattled off several things about the vulture that seemed to cover many of the aspects of the case. But then they said, we can't explain the missing memory and why people couldn't kill it and all these other things. And that was the, I think the most difficult part is no matter what piece of the puzzle we tried to put it into, it didn't quite fit entirely. And it is, when you read the book and you look at the case, at first you perhaps think this might be some kind of cryptid. But then again, we've got this weird light, which kind of removes it from the majority of it. When you finish reading your, your book, Chad... You're kind of scratching your head because it's one of those creatures that seems to be strange in the fact that there are a few cases like this dotted around the States where you have a couple of sightings or a sightings over a small period of time of something that just doesn't resemble anything else that you would normally expect. Um, the Dover Demon is, is one that springs to mind because that's a very odd creature. The Enfield Horror is another one. Um, the Fresno Night Stalkers or, or Crawlers, as some people call them as well, Chad, where this just seems so peculiar, you can't kind of pigeonhole it amongst anything else, really, can you? We tried. We looked at all the cases. You mentioned the Hopkinsville, uh, the Goblins, and we looked at Mothman stories. And we even, because people contacted us wondering if we had searched for any tragedies happening before, uh, during, or after the sighting of this creature, like they attribute to the Mothman story, mm. or missing livestock or any dead animals, and we were unable to find any of that, but partly because a lot of the history is missing. We know that Van Meter had a newspaper, a local newspaper, that was operating during this time period. 
But now no uh, examples of it have been found. Nobody has an article or a newspaper from that time, not just that deals with the visitor, but any day. But we know it existed, but the, no one has a copy of the newspaper. All the newspaper accounts came from Des Moines and the surrounding towns. So where did this Van Meter uh, newspaper run off to? Just <laughs> another mystery that just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And at the end of the book, all three of us, Noah, Kevin, and myself, all did a final thoughts chapter where – our goal was to sum up what we thought this thing was, why we thought it was that, and give our evidence uh, based on why we concluded that. And for me, that was the hardest chapter. And I remember on many drives to and from Van Meter with those guys of just being completely puzzled. Like, I have no idea whatsoever what this thing was. If I had to choose on my deathbed, I could probably place it in some category, but at best, that would be a 50-50 guess. <laughs> oh, I think for a lot of people, I think that would be a very depressing or a sign of failure on their part that they weren't able to explain this or solve the mystery. But for me... Uh, that's expected. I never really thought outside of it being a hoax that we were going to solve it, especially when I started learning the intricate details of it and how just puzzling it was that for me, I just embraced the story. I took it in for the weirdness that it is and enjoyed it. And if I can't explain it, that it in some ways makes the legend even more enjoyable to me that I have no idea. I mean, I would be saddened to find out that it was some known animal or even if it was an unknown explanation and the mystery was put to rest, you know, part of me would be kind of sad by that. <laughs> yeah. Would you say it's one of the strangest or perhaps even the strangest case you've investigated then, Chad? If it isn't the strangest case, it's right up at the top. I can't off my head think of anything odder. Uh, perhaps the Wendigo legend, but that mm. has 400 years of uh, folklore behind it. But even that in terms of this cryptid of the visitor, again, this giant eight-foot bat creature, a horn on its head that could project light. It has the ability to wipe away your memories. This thing's just too fantastic. And I wonder if I'll ever run across another case like this. So Van Meter itself, Chad, other than this strange and unusual case that, as we've said, lasts a week... Does the area have a history of strangeness? Does it have a, a, a tradition of hauntings or anything else in the area? It does. It did back then as well that during the time of the, the visitor, the Iowa newspapers were filled with stories of homes being haunted, businesses, airships flying in the sky, UFOs, mm -hmm. sea serpents. There was even a report or two of a sea serpent being in the Raccoon River, which runs right alongside Van Meter. So townsfolk were aware that weirdness was going on. And that's something that has carried through that uh, years later, decades later, the old brick and tile factory was abandoned. and But many of the remnant buildings were still there in bad disrepair, but they were still there. And of course, these old abandoned locations that are so rife with cryptids, or at least cryptid stories, also attracted youngsters in the area. So teenagers mostly would be attracted to the old abandoned buildings, and they would go out there because they thought it was haunted. They would see shadowy figures around them and in the sky, and they would see bricks being thrown on their own as though tossed by some unseen force. Mm -hmm. But since they had forgotten the legend of the visitor, they chalked it up to being a haunted area. And to this day, people know it just as much for its haunting as they do for the visitor story. Yeah, yeah, another perplexing layer to it all, Chad. Well, I think it illustrates that these things, these areas might be what John Keel thought were window areas or these paranormal beacons, these mm. hot spots where not only do you get 
cryptids, but you get stories of UFOs, hauntings, and all sorts of other phenomena that seem to all transpire in this small little area. And whether it's something about the land, the people, or something else, these things all seem to be happening at the same time. Yeah, there's something about these sleepy towns that just seem to attract high strangeness, Chad. I agree with that completely, and it happens today, but it, as illustrated by this case, it happens 118 years ago as well. And when the book came out, uh, many recent witnesses had not stepped forward as of yet. Uh, but since the book came out, I've talked to at least half a dozen people who claim that they've seen something similar in the area to the visitor. Uh, for instance, one gentleman told me as we were giving a walking tour uh, at the visitor festival that he had moved to the area in the 1980s, had no idea about the legend. It was nearly forgotten uh, through this entire uh, decades uh, until we rediscovered the articles. And he was walking with his dog out on the trail, the road that leads alongside the abandoned brick and tile factory. And he said he saw what appeared to be a five or six foot bat fly overhead. And his dog was so spooked, so terrified that they kind of hightailed it back to their house because it was late, it was dark, and they were new to the area. And he said he did not take his dog out walking in that area for quite some time, but he didn't think anything of it because he didn't know the story. It wasn't until the story started surfacing again that he thought, Perhaps, maybe, that's what I saw. How peculiar. So, that was the other aspect I was going to touch on. Have we had more modern sightings then? So, once again, Chad, it seems that when you drag a story into the modern era and publicise it and investigate it and talk about it, people then once again feel comfortable in saying, actually, I've seen something like that recently. There are two ways to look at a creature or a legend getting notoriety. And skeptics come at it from the angle of that once a legend becomes very well known, that it's going to lead to confirmation bias, that mm. people are now going to see every turkey vulture, every crane, every other creature as being the visitor. But there's an also a flip side to that equation that I think might explain it more accurately in the fact that once somebody's aware of something, you're more likely to pay attention to it than you were before. So if you're on a lake where there's a lot of sea serpent stories, you might be looking for stuff that normally you'd have your hand in your phone or m monkeying through your tackle box yeah. uh, board. But now you're scanning the lateral waves to see if something is making itself known. And uh, the analogy I also often give is that when you all of a sudden when you buy a new car, you start seeing that car everywhere you go, where mm. <laughs> there's not all of a sudden an influx of new owners buying that vehicle, but you just didn't notice it before. But once you're aware of it, you can start to appreciate it. So I think that happens quite a bit. And sometimes these things happen and the person's not even aware of the legend. Um not too far from Van Meter is a small town called Colfax, Iowa. Mm. And a couple years ago, a pastor contacted me, said he was waiting for a friend at a meeting out in the country, and he saw what he thought was some dragon-like beast flying in the sky. And he watched it for a bit before it disappeared. And when he went home, he Googled Iowa Dragon, and of course the visitor popped up, and he said, that's exactly what I saw. But... He had no prior knowledge of the visitor before his own sighting. Wow. And once again, you have a well-respected member of the local community coming forward there, Chad. I think it fits the pattern of previous witnesses. But yeah. one main thing that I had hoped for and maybe still do hope for is that when the book came out, I was hoping that 
we would gather more information from somebody that read the book, maybe doesn't live in Van Meter any longer, but their grandma or grandpa or great uncle did. And mm. they would start uh, rummaging through the belongings of the lost loved one and find a journal mm. or a, foam, uh, a photograph yeah. or something that would provide some proof or, or uh, you know, debunking it one way or the other. And I think that still may happen. I mean, I'm optimistic at least, but I was really hoping that somebody would come out of the woodwork and say, oh, here's grandpa stacks of paper, newspaper from Van Meter in 1903. Here's a picture of the bank window being shot out. Yeah. yeah. Well, you never know. Stranger things have happened, Chad, when these things turn up. And I think as the story gains in popularity and more and more people hear of it, that that's more likely to happen. Remember, in terms of cryptids, I mean, the visitor might be one of the oldest, but it was only recently rediscovered and uh, promoted, if you will, that until just maybe even a decade ago, nobody had ever heard of it, including myself. So how's the town celebrating it? Because I know, obviously, they, they now have a regular, under normal circumstances, Chad, they have a regular sort of van meter visitor festival at the end of september so is that one of those things that that's very similar to to what happened with the mothman festival that it was just trundling along quite nicely the mothman prophecies film came out and all of a sudden the the visitor numbers trebled yeah um we're waiting for the hollywood uh <laughs> version of this you know i like to think who would play kevin nelson but uh I'm not quite sure. But yes, so the, the town puts together this Van Meter Visitor Festival. It's always the last weekend of September to correlate with the actual anniversary of the sightings. And and I love this so much because the town has not changed over the last hundred and some years. That mm. the bank, the where Mr. Dunn shot out the front window. Even though now it's a law firm, but the vault's still there. And you can go in and see the bank vault where he probably shot the window out from. You can see some of the buildings where the creature was perched upon and where they shot it. You can walk two and a half blocks on foot out to the abandoned coal mine and the brick and tile factory and see it all. You don't need a huge imagination to rediscover and wonder what it would have been like in 1903 when these people saw it. So that's what really stands out. I love the Mothman Festival. Uh, I spoke there a few years ago, but the main festival takes place in downtown Point Pleasant, where the sightings, almost all of them took place out by the TNT area, a few miles on the outskirts of town. So although you're celebrating in one area, you know the, the main activity happened in another. That's mm. not the way it is in Van Meter. You're right in smack dab in the middle of where the events took place. Yeah, well, I suppose, yeah, you're basically walking in the footsteps of the, of the event and, and the building properties and the lots will still be there then, Chad, yeah? Yeah, and I think as a testament to the town's acceptance of this, they've had through the years, their local uh, grade schools uh, have... Um, coloring and art competitions or uh, not necessarily competitions, but um, gatherings where they give all the you know second graders a paper and say, draw what you think the visitor was. And then they <laughs> display everybody's idea at the festival and you get the weird, weird uh, drawings. And so I think that's my favorite part, again, where even people who might not necessarily be into uh, cryptozoology or the supernatural they get involved with it as a, a fun community event. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's one of the aspects of, of things like this that often gets overlooked, Chad, is that it's making people proud of the town again and probably bringing them back together. It is, and it's, I don't know if it's creating more paranormal phenomena or people mm. are just experiencing it more but a few years ago uh, someone took a picture of what appeared to be a woman in a gown a glowing ghostly gown walking down one of the main streets uh, two mm. years ago someone found a giant three-toed print out uh, in the country where the uh, abandoned coal mine was uh, on the night of the tour which 
you know, for a lot of people, it was a little fishy. But <laughs> if you know anything about how supernatural and high strangeness works, yeah, that would fit right in. That what better way to confuse and make it even more puzzling than to have a footprint appear on a tour? Yeah, absolutely, very much so. Uh, <laughs> well, it's it's a fabulous case, Chad, and it's a wonderful book as as always from yourself, Kevin and, and Noah, and. Um, and as usual, everybody can get it from the uh, the Back Roads Law website as well. So you, you're currently just about, or you've just released your latest book, which I believe is all about the wonderful world of supernatural curses. I'm fascinated by places that have a supernatural or paranormal reputation where you have to do something in order for the legend to come true. And whether that's knock three times on a haunted crypt and a demon will come up and grab you <laughs> or pass through seven different gates in order for a portal to hell that will open up or sit on a haunted mausoleum and the spirit of those inside will shove you off. And there's always mishap, misfortune, or death that follows these dares, as I call them. That it's never anything good that if you do the dare, you're going to find true love or win the lottery. Yes. It's always people contacting me saying they broke up with their significant other, they lost their employment, they were involved in a car accident, or their cousin died. So it's always tragedy and bad luck that will befall you. So I collected uh, about 40 of these places around the Midwest that I went to and tried the dare, and I put them into a guide where anyone who's on a suicide mission can follow in my footsteps and give them a try. <laughs> so I would, I would imagine it's quite daunting, Chad, because as open-minded as we like to be about these certain subjects, I suppose if, if you hear enough bad luck stories about certain things... Whether you believe in it or not, I suppose a, a little bit of you starts to think, what if? That's exactly true. Even I fell for it myself quite a bit that uh, there was a, a case uh, in Iowa, again, of this place called Terror Bridge, mm -hmm. that if you park your car on the bridge, the spirit of a murdering mother will try to throw you over the train tracks onto an oncoming train. Mm -hmm. And when I was there with a couple colleagues, uh, nothing happened, fortunately, or maybe unluckily. But as we were leaving, I received a speeding ticket. My first one in 20 plus years. And I always laugh about it thinking that, well, if it was the curse of this ghostly lady, I consider myself getting off quite easy compared to, you know, death and uh, dismemberment and all these other things. A speeding ticket, no big deal. <laughs> yes, very much so. So did you notice any trends, Chad? Because often there are numerous kinds of curses like, haunted chairs or certain mirrors or certain locations and there are numerous accounts of people taking pebbles or stones or artifacts from sacred sites and having problems at home and, and a run of bad luck so were you able to kind of gauge them together and, and have certain types of curses that seem to be more common or, or do you think they're just anything can be classed as being cursed if people believe it well, I tried to in the beginning of the book, as you know, my background's in the field of psychology. So mm. in the beginning of the book, I really took a, a deep dive as much as I could while still keeping it in the paranormal realm into not only why we like getting scared, but also some of the rituals and uh, that need to be done that you see over and over and why that is. So I looked at these dares as rites of passage. I looked at them as tests of bravery, but I also looked at the significance of why it kept repeating over and over and over that you'd have to do things three times, mm. whether it was run around a grave and roses will start smelling or knock on a crypt. If you have to do something a certain amount of times, most likely it would be three. So I tried to dive deep into looking at you know, the Holy Trinity and a body, mind, spirit, past, present, future. It's the significance of three with uh, Freud's id and the ego and superego and the like. 
And I also looked at why most of these had to be done at night, especially at midnight, or why so many involved bridges and so many involved chairs, as you mentioned, the death chair, the devil's chair, the cursed chair, the witch's chair, mm. all of these chairs where what's so scary about sitting down? But yet <laughs> that's where the legends came. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. They're usually in bars as well, these chairs, Chad. I, whether that's to stop pe it keeps people away from buying drinks at the bar, I'm not sure. And bars are another location that have a ton of supernatural stories associated with them. And, of course, it makes sense that if you die, uh, when you die, if you do become a ghost, why wouldn't you hang out at the places you liked hanging out when you were alive? I mean, who would sit around the cemetery haunting that? Maybe that's why there are so many haunted pubs or haunted theaters, because that's where people like going and that's where the energy is. So maybe that's what attracts or creates these legends. And I think because of the media and Hollywood, we do think of graveyards as being haunted, but it wasn't always like that. People in the old days would picnic in graveyards and mm -hmm. sit there with their friends and family at the gravesite of their lost loved one. And it would be a festive place and it would be a joyous event where today it's not quite that same way because we're a little more far removed from death than we were back then. Were you able to kind of look at it and see that some of these curses are are urban myths that have just expanded, Chad, or were they really deep ingrained cultural superstitions depending on perhaps a, an immigrant population that had moved over from from another part of the world say Europe or, or somewhere that had brought a tradition with them to wherever and that had become ingrained in the local community a little bit of both uh, an example in Winona Minnesota there was a case from the early 1900s where a family uh, started having their children pass away the first one was their daughter and then four sons followed very quickly in the daughter's footsteps. And they lived on the east end of Winona, which was uh, a lot of immigrant families coming over at that time. And they were very superstitious. So they told the, uh, the father of the family that in order to stop the rest of his children from dying, he needed to go out to the cemetery, dig up the uh, grave of his first daughter that died, and chop off her head and bury it separately from the body because it was believed in that culture that the first death in a family would act like a death siren, enticing mm -hmm. all of their siblings to join them in death. And believe it or not, he went out there to the cemetery, dug up his daughter, but then he got cold feet. He could not desecrate the body. He just placed a crucifix on her head and reburied her. But when the police found out, they had to make sure that he hadn't uh, defiled the body. So they re-dug her up. And sure enough, he hadn't chopped off her head. But my favorite part is that there were no charges brought against the father. Apparently, in those days, you could dig up a body as many times as you wanted, as long as you didn't harm it. So these superstitions were very deep-seated in the community, and they still are. Today, a lot of these legend trips are seen as a rite of passage, where people will tell me that it's just something teenagers did in their community to go out to the haunted woods, that it was a you know, test of bravery. Could you stay out there longer than your buddies? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think that story as well, Chad, there's a lot of sort of parts of that that are very similar to, to the vampire myth, really, aren't they? They really do, and you start to see a lot of similarities where here in the U.S., uh, I put one deer in, it's called Crybaby Bridge in Illinois, and you could have put one in from every state in the entire country here. They all have a Crybaby Bridge, and you start mm. to see a lot of these similarities. And when I was on with uh, Kevin Nelson and we did the Wendigo uh, book with you uh, yeah. prior uh, we talked about how many different cultures overlapped in that legend, that you'd never really have just one culture. You have a mix of other people coming in and putting their spin on it. So you get some werewolf lore, you get some vampire lore thrown in there, and, and it's never pure as you would think it, it was, mm -hmm. that 
all these other peoples are putting their own history, their own mystery into the legend. And it's something, I suppose, that you can, as, as you've said, this one you've you've focused on the Midwest, Chad, but I suppose you could probably take a, a, a chunk of anywhere in North America and you would find a similar collection of weird beliefs and superstitions and curses that would match or be very similar or or a local version of, of something that you would be able to find probably in every state in the States. You really could. You could do it state by state by state, just like people are doing cryptids or haunted places. You could do curses, and there would be a lot of similarities that you would have very similar stories, even down to the effects that will befall you when you do these things, whether you're in California or New York or in the South. No matter where you went, you'd have a lot of similarities, which is a really interesting concept when you think that until more recent modern times, these legends, they didn't spread that far. Unless it was the Loch Ness Monster or something else, most of these were just regional tales that if you weren't from the region or you weren't traveling there, you wouldn't know about it. Where you wouldn't hear about a case in Florida of a phantom man hanging from the rafters would appear, and then you'd see it in Wisconsin. Um, you wouldn't get that until modern time. Ah, so it's almost as if they're growing then, Chad, yeah? They're one of my favorite things of my research, and I consider myself more of a folklorist or historian than some supernatural researcher because I'm very fascinated in how these legends morph and progress over the years. I've talked to many old timers that will tell me a version of a legend in town. And then you talk to teenagers or college age kids and they have a completely different version of the same legend mm. that is like the telephone game that over the generation after generation, new people put their spin on it, their take on it. And the legends are always living. They're not stagnant. They're not dead. They're always living, breathing parts of folklore. Yeah, well, I think they are. I think they should be classed as modern folklore, Chad, rather than superstition or urban myth. I think often we forget the term folklore and seem to prescribe it to things that happened 100 years ago, 200 years ago, rather than what's going on right now is essentially modern folklore, isn't it? It really is. Now, most folklorists will laugh at you for saying that. You know, they're looking at folklore as being a pottery and quilt making and uh, along those lines. But I think it really is a supernatural folklore or a paranormal folklore that these legends uh, incorporate much more than old pots do for a lot of people. So I think it's starting to get a little more mainstream in academia, but I remember I did my master's thesis on students' belief in the paranormal, hmm. and the college I was at, there was an uproar from many professors saying this should not be allowed. So even though I tweaked it to looking at human perception and human belief systems in a psychological manner, there were a lot of professors who did not want my thesis to be approved because they didn't think it was academic enough. And of course, that was, you know, almost 18 years ago or something. So times have changed, even more so than when I used to hear stories from people, they would look around and in a hushed tone say, this is my story I have to tell you making sure nobody was listening or watching them. Yeah. And today, if I do a lecture, 20 people will raise their hand and want to tell their story. So times have changed very quickly. Ah, well, and all power to them. And, and long may it continue that we find these wonderful stories, because some of them are, are really quite unique and I think deserve to be saved for posterity and, and for future generations. A lot of these are dying out. Of course, you have Mothman and Bigfoot and Loch Ness. They'll never die. I mean, they're just too ingrained into all societies. But mm. I think some of these more obscure legends, like the Visitor, it did die out for seven, eight, uh, almost nine decades. Mm. Um, nobody remembered it or thought about it. But I think others are just dying out. And I think one of the aspects to that is that people are much more mobile than they used to be, mm. where 
it's not where people are born in a city and live their entire life, work at the local factory, retire there, and never leave. People are living in six, eight, ten more cities during their life. So it doesn't provide the opportunity to get grounded and put deep roots in and find these legends. So a lot of them are dying out. Well, and let's hope people keep tracking them down, Chad, because I love discovering new stories like this. And the Van Meter Visitor is a prime example of a wonderful story that deserves to be known far better than it currently is. So where can everybody get hold of a copy of, of the Van Meter Visitor and your latest book, Supernatural Dares? Sure. Easiest place is my website, which is chadlewisresearch.com. Yeah, that's the easiest place. Every bookstore that in America, uh, you can look. Wherever you can still buy books anymore, you'll find it. But uh, my website, if you want to tell me a story or ask a question or tell me a curse that you think should end my life, uh, <laughs> I'm open to all of it. <laughs> Okay, so and if you manage to survive, what's next up for you then, Chad? Where, where else have you got planned coming up? Well, I'm now battling lumberjack legends of creatures. In, in America, uh, back in the lumber era of the 1800s, early 1900s, lumberjacks came up with fantastic legends of creatures that were inhabiting the woods, like the hoop snake, a yes. snake that could wrap its tail in its mouth and chase you like a hoop, uh, hoop. or the hoogag, this giant moose-like creature with a lip that dragged on the forest floor, or the hide-behind, a creature that no matter what you did, it would be behind you. Yes. If you jumped 180 degrees, it would still be behind you. <laughs> so they would tell these stories at the lumber camps of Paul Bunyan and others, and they would tell them to the uh, rookies that were coming in, the greenhorns that knew nothing about the woods. Yeah. So I'm fascinated by these creatures that were obviously only existed in the lumberjacks' yarns and tall tales. So I'm putting together a small little monograph of 20 of my favorite Northwoods lumber creatures uh, that you should avoid out in the woods uh, or go looking for them at your own peril. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. I'm, I would imagine that will be fascinating and hilarious at the same time, knowing knowing the little I know about a couple of the ones you've mentioned there, Chad. They always bring a chuckle to my... Uh, <laughs> bring make me laugh more than anything because they are so so peculiar and a lot of them are, are clearly leg-pulling going on. And I think that really shows where my interests in the field now are. They're at the fringe mm. of the, the field where, again, back to the folklore, you know, obviously these creatures are made up. They don't exist uh, that we know of, obviously. But that's my interest. I'm interested in hobo legends of folklore, of the supernatural, and circus and carnival legends of uh, curses and folklore where they might not be in your bread and butter Bigfoot paranormal, but they are on the uh, peripheral vision of the the folklore. And I think those areas are not getting enough attention. Uh, sea serpents are getting plenty of attention. I've done several books on them. Bigfoot, you can't throw a rock without hitting a Bigfoot book. <laughs> and, and I love them all. But for me, the outskirts, that obscureness of these legends is what draws me. Oh, well, fantastic. And I look forward to whatever you've got planned, Chad. So, as always, it's a real pleasure to speak with you. Thank you again for your time. And no doubt we will speak soon. And I can't wait to read the latest book. Thank you, as always. Keep an eye out. 